Elizabeth Warren rocked the boat this week when she endorsed two progressive challenges over conservative Democratic incumbents. In her endorsement of Henry Cuellar's 26-year-old challenger, Jessica Cisneros, Warren wrote, Jessica knows our diversity is our strength and that when progressives are unapologetic about our values and who we're in this battle for, we win. But while Senator Warren embraces progressive challengers and progressive priorities like Medicare for All, she's also conducting aggressive outreach to the Democratic establishment. So what is Warren's strategy? How does it contrast with Bernie Sanders? And will it work? Joining us now to discuss all these things and so much more is Megan Day, staff writer at Jacobin Magazine. Great to see you. Great to see you. What did you make of this development with uh, Warren endorsing these two this week? I mean, I think it's great. I think that it's, in general, uh, a positive thing if Warren, you know, swings hard for progressives and uses her platform to do that. We need all hands on deck when it comes to promoting progressive ideas, left-wing ideas, ambitious ideas, and the politicians or, or would-be politicians on the ground who are actually building movements and cohering constituencies of, of ordinary working class people who can push for that. So I think it's excellent, but uh, you probably had me on because I also have some reservations about Elizabeth Warren, right? <laughs> Indeed. That's right, Megan. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that caught our eye is you've, you've been very critical of Elizabeth Warren and her so-called donor strategy. She said that she won't take uh, big donor money for now. However, she did previously. She's not necessarily ruling it out in the future. I know this is an important issue to many people on the progressive left. Tell us a little bit about your concerns. So Elizabeth Warren uh, promised that she would not be courting mega donors during the primary, which is great. And so far, she has actually managed to elide the traditional top dollar donor circuit um, that has been the sort of Democratic Party's bread and butter for decades and has received sort of tacit approval for decades. Um, the problem is that she was raising money from mega donors all the way up to her 2018 re-election to the Senate, and she rolled over about $10 million of that money into her 2020 campaign. So she seeded her campaign with money from mega donors and is currently right. using some of that money to, to buttress her campaign. And then bookending that on the other end, she has said, and she said this for a while, this isn't new, that uh, if she wins the primary, she will revert to you know uh, taking money from whoever, basically. Basically, she's not going to continue to avoid Martha's Vineyard and Silicon Valley and, and Manhattan. She's going to... Um, go, you know, schmooze with mega donors and her ra her rationale for that is that uh, we need all of the, if she were to win the primary, she needs all the help that she can get to beat Donald Trump. Now that mm -hmm. sounds like a perfectly acceptable justification, right? Who doesn't want to beat Trump? But on the other hand, we have Bernie Sanders, who's somebody who's pretty confident that he can beat Donald Trump without taking corporate money. And in fact, that's a big part of his strategy for beating Donald Trump is to unite ordinary working class people in mass numbers and use that mass movement to beat Donald Trump and uh, have it carry him into the White House. And then, of course, the other part of his strategy is that he hopes that that exact same mass movement will buttress him and support him when he goes to taking, when he when he finally gets to the point where he needs to take on uh, rich and powerful interests from the Oval Office. So there's a fundamental difference here between Warren and Sanders. Warren is saying, I'm going to take on the rich and powerful, but first I need to to get to office. So that means, you know, uh, I'm going to take rich people's money and then I'm going to turn around and, you know, not pay attention to uh, rich people's interests when I'm in office. And Sanders has said pretty blatantly that you can't uh, change a rigged system if you're taking that system's money. I mean, what do you think that that difference in their fundraising approach says, just to be more direct, about how they're go they will govern? What does that really mean in terms of how a Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren administration might unfold? Right. I mean, we don't necessarily have to divine how they would govern by looking at their fundraising strategies. It's more like we have information about how they would govern from the way that they're campaigning and their fundraising strategies are part of that. So uh, Elizabeth Warren is uh, a longtime crusader against corporate excesses, but she's also someone who likes to extol the virtues of capitalist markets, well-regulated capitalist markets. So she often says that, you know, when she wins, she's going to take on corporations. But what she really means is she's going to whip corporations into shape. She's going to bring good corporations in as key partners in social change. And she's basically going to try to bring out the best in the private sector. She says this pretty explicitly. You saw her say this at the uh, climate uh, town hall that just happened when asked 
if she would bring public uh, private utilities under public ownership. She said, no, I don't want to discourage people from making a profit if that's what they want to do, because that can be a very good thing, right? Bernie Sanders, uh, in contrast, he has a much more class antagonistic view of politics, which is yeah. to say that he wants to win victories for the working class majority by contravening the wishes of the capitalist class. And he knows that every solid victory for the working class majority is going to come at the expense of some very rich person somewhere. And he basically says that's part of the deal. If you look at FDR, if you look at revolutionary changes that have swept government, it wasn't just the election or the backing of the people that did it. FDR and many of these other people had to bring in hundreds of people into their administration. It's basically about personnel is policy. Now, Elizabeth Warren, by cozying up to the establishment and making them essentially bow to beliefs that would have been anathema five to six years ago, could be co-opting very useful and important people for whenever she were to get into office. So what, what would your response to that theory of how implementation actually goes about whenever you come into power? Well, I certainly agree that you know heads of state in the past who have made um, who have made important changes like FDR and the New Deal have had to you know form um, cross class coalitions to get it done. But let's not forget why FDR was put in the hot seat and decided to pursue the New Deal. It's because the capitalist class feared a working class revolution. There was so much working class activity. There were so many strikes. Unions were peaking. That there and 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 the Great Depression in particular had left so many people so disenchanted with the establishment that there was actually some great concern that the people were going to rise up. And if they didn't do something like the New Deal, then something uh, worse was going to happen for the capitalist class. So I don't entirely agree with the the entire um, theory of change that you're setting forth. The idea that mm -hmm. change happens at the top when you know people uh, who have power form coalitions with each other. That's certainly a part of it, but what it what matters the most is what they're responding to on the ground. And I think that yeah. in, what's interesting about Bernie Sanders is that he actually sees his role as galvanizing ordinary people on the ground to be a part of what he calls a political revolution, to actually um, you know, amass their forces and start pushing for change outside the established halls of power. He seems to want that, and he's hoping that he can organize the forces that can, can create a ruckus, basically, once he's president, so that you know that ruckus can help him compel others in the halls of power to make the changes that he wants yeah. to make. And Megan, um, Ryan Grimm over the, at the Intercept was noting that Elizabeth Warren seems to have recently adopted that same language of a sort of grassroots movement to pressure people in D.C. What do you make of that? You know, I, I've noticed that she's been adopting that language, and I, I'm, I'm of two minds about it. On the one hand, I am happy to see that kind of language entering the mainstream, because I'm not sure that it's we can so easily come back from it, right? Like, once we start to make this a norm for what you sound like, if you want to claim the mantle of progressive, then it's kind of hard to roll that back, which is which is great. On the other hand, I do think that it contradicts many of the ways that she's actually campaigning. She's been, um, you know, networking with uh, Democratic Party insiders and assuring them behind the scenes that they have nothing to fear. She doesn't want to stage a hostile takeover of the party. Um, she doesn't, you know, she's not an outsider. She's an insider. She's their she's sort of their frenemy. She wants to whip people <laughs> into shape, but she also she's like a pal. Um, Bernie Sanders uh, is a uh, uh, characteristically cantankerous. I don't think that he wants uh, anyone who is not really his friend to think that that he's their friend. I think that he actually enjoys being reviled by people who he personally reviles. Um, so he doesn't actually play that game, and he holds the Democratic Party establishment at an arm's length. And importantly, for the purposes of the article that I just wrote, he also holds uh, the rich liberal donor network at an arm's length. And he basically right. says, I don't want your money. Because if I were to take your money, that would be a tacit promise to you that I will be looking out for your interests in decisive moments. And the fact of the matter is that I'm only going to be looking out for the interests of the vast majority of working people in this country. He says out and out that he is an existential threat mm. to the Democratic establishment. Right. I don't think he's he's shy about that. And it's a very distinct approach from the way Elizabeth Warren has gone about running her campaign and, and governing while she's been in the Senate. Um, Megan, so great to have you today. Thank Thanks you for so joining much. us, Megan. Thanks, guys. Bye. And we'll have more rising after this.